Before we get in the program, I'd like to acknowledge at the La Crosse Public Library, where my colleague Libby and I are broadcasting from tonight, occupies the ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk, who stored this land since time immemorial. Because I'm a local history librarian and we're all here today to learn a little bit of history, I'm going to extend that land recognition statement with a small amount of context. The city of La Crosse occupies land that was once a prairie that was home to a band of Ho-Chunk. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, an attempt to forcibly and often violently remove indigenous peoples from their ancestral lands located east of the Mississippi River to occupy territory west of the river. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, the federal government conducted a series of six attempts to forcibly remove the local Ho-Chunk by steamboat via the Mississippi River to reservations in Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, and then finally to Nebraska. The historic steamboat landing where that took place is now Spence Park in downtown La Crosse, uh, which, which is just across the street from the Charmant. However, many of La Crosse's Ho-Chunk found their way back to their homeland here in La Crosse, and eventually the federal and local governments moved on to new strategies to eradicate indigenous folks and culture from the newly established United States of America. And a note here, this was happening parallel to sundown town strategies that worked to keep communities all white. If you're not from the city of La Crosse, I encourage you to research the land, the indigenous land that your home, community, and place of work all occupy. Um, and if you want help with that research, I'm here to help as your local history librarian. Uh, now, Dr. Sabrina Robbins, one of our panelists tonight, will um, who's representing African Heritage Inc., um, which is a nonprofit in the Fox Cities. She's going to share a labor acknowledgement with us provided by African Heritage. Thank you uh, very much, Jenny. Uh, here's a reading of the land acknowledgement. We recognize that the United States, as we know it was built at the often fatal expense of forcefully enslaved people. We must acknowledge that must, much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, economic growth and development has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking, chattel slavery, and later on dehumanization through segregation and Jim Crow laws. We acknowledge and remember those who did not survive the Middle Passage, those who were beaten and lynched at the hands of white Americans and those who are still suffering while fighting for their freedom. We are indebted to their labor and their unwilling sacrifice and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and the resulting impact in generational trauma is still felt and witnessed today. African Heritage Inc. honors the indigenous and our enslaved people's contributions, stewardship of the land and waterways throughout our service area. We honor and celebrate their resilience. We commit to creating a future founded on respect and healing the deepest generational wounds by building bridges and mutual understanding. We will continue to re-educate ourselves and others about the histories and experiences of Black people in our region. And um, part of this labor acknowledgement was created by Christopher Maxwell and the Black Theater Caucus, as well as authors of We See You, Demands, the Mid-American, Arts Alliance and Dr. TJ Stewart from Iowa State University for providing the framework of this language. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Robbins. Um, before I begin with my research, um, I'd like to thank a few people. First, Shondell Spivey, who inspired me to do this research in 2015 and supported me along the way. Um, Thomas Harris, who got me to Philadelphia for a conference and a chance to meet James Lowen in person. Gretchen Lockett for finding the resources to conduct an oral history with Robbie Moss in 1982. And then also Robbie Moss for her willingness to share her life story and experiences in that oral history interview. So first, what is a sundown town? Uh, one standard definition is this on the screen. 
a community that purposefully excluded Black Americans by force, law, or custom. James Lowen, a sociologist and author of the book Sundown Towns, A Hidden Dimension of American Racism, has a broad definition of this phenomena. Um, by his definition, any community that purposefully and knowingly maintained a culture of keeping their town white is a sundown town. Um, and some historians want to keep that definition of a sundown town a little bit more narrow, that only communities that had a sign or an ordinance or a sirening, a siren warning at Black Americans to leave before dark are sundown towns. Um, and they argue that communities that use other strategies need a different term altogether. This quote on the screen, I believe, sums up what drove James Lowen in his work and what drove me in my own research. This is an ongoing shame in our nation. It's still going on right now across the North. We've got to know about it. The first way to change it is to out it. Because these communities wanted to be exclusive, but they don't want to be seen as excluding. So we need to out them and change them. In undergrad, I was studying not just how to be a historian, but how to be a public historian. And for me, creating change through history education is what it means to be an, a public historian. And I think this quote really shows that. Um, so this means that as I was studying and learning about our local history, I was constantly considering how to share this information with the public. When I decided I wanted my seminar project to focus on the history of anti-Black racism in our community, I didn't know about sundown towns yet. I, I found that along the way of my research, um, but I knew from the beginning that I would do my best to turn my capstone project into a public history project. Something else I want to emphasize here, because my original research was an undergraduate project, there are holes in it. Uh, that's why I'm here tonight presenting this research again, because it wasn't finished. Research never really is complete. Um, I specify the differing definitions of sundown towns because it's important for you to know that I use James Lone's definition to back up my thesis. Um, and to be honest, a weakness in my research is that I didn't question his definition or consider the thoughts of other academics with conflicting definitions, but I am now considering these things. And in order for this research to grow um, and in order for our community to grow, we have to really talk about that, I think. So I'm sharing this all with you um, for some transparency. I want you aware of how my perspective has changed and know that it'll continue to change as time goes on. Some more backstory here. Um, so Shondell Spivey, who was at the time a member of the city's Human Rights Commission, facilitated, facilitated a meeting for me and Mayor Tim Cabot in 2016 in order for me to share my research with him. Um, also at this time, UWL faculty and staff members like Thomas Harris and Ariel Bojo found funding to bring James Lowen to La Crosse to speak about sundown towns. In support, um, Mayor Tim Cabot signed a proclamation acknowledging and apologizing for this history of anti-Black racism and discrimination in La Crosse. So as quickly as I can, I'm going to run through what my research looked like at the time and also what I've found since. Because his definition is broad, um, James Lowen outlines the different strategies that communities use to keep their communities all white. And the words all white are in quotation marks because sometimes sundown towns did indeed have black residents, just not many, perhaps one or two households. Um, and for the case of La Crosse, that is true. There was never a time where there was absolutely no black residents since even before um, the incorporation of our city in the 1850s. Different strategies identified by loan are violence, threat of violence, ordinances, um, developing a new suburb, and a freeze out. In my research, I argued that the strategy used in La Crosse was a freeze out. Although I will say that I believe that there were cases where there was at least at the very least a threat of violence for Black American residents in La Crosse. Freezeouts can include things that are hard to track in primary sources, you know, like landlords not renting or realtors not selling to Black Americans. But there are some primary sources that track evidence of this strategy. Um, I argued that instances of segregation signs in downtown, a local KKK presence, refusal of service, and racist language commonly used in the local newspaper and in place names were all examples of how the cross enforced its freeze out of Black Americans. I use these examples because I can back them up with primary sources, but it's not to say that there were not other practices happening within our community. 
every time I doubted myself and my research, I would always ground myself by looking at our population disparities, which echo what sundown town demographics often look like. Um, from the 1850s until 1906, as you can see on the screen here, La Crosse was on average always supported by a one to 2% black population. However, national, state, and then local politics began to change in the years after the reconstruction era ended in 1877. This period of time is known as the great nadir of American race relations in our nation's history. One outcome of the nadir is sundown towns and La Crosse was not an exception. By 1910, La Crosse's black population plummeted and it stayed below 1% until the 1990s. Note that La Crosse experienced its largest growth of the 20th century during the 1920s. We grew from about 30,400 people to 39,600 residents. So that's about 9,000 people. Yet the number of black Americans went from 39 to 38. Another important statistic, um, in 1980, La Crosse was reported in the US census to be the fifth whitest metropolitan area in the nation. In my research, I didn't really focus on that pre-1906 timeframe because it had already been pretty well documented by historian Bruce Mauser, who thoroughly tracked La Crosse's early Black population. In his research, um, sorry, it's his research that gives us the rich history presented by the Enduring Families Project here in La Crosse today. Um, and I can post a link to their work in our chat here when I'm done. So let's run through the primary sources that I used to support my argument of La Crosse's freeze out. First, we have oral histories. The UWL oral history program collected oral histories from La Crosse residents as early as the 1960s. This collection is a rich resource of what life was like from the um, late 1800s through the early 20th century. On the screen here, we have an example of an interview done by Howard Fredericks, who was the founder of the UWL Oral History Program. It's important to note that today we can't really consider Fredericks an absolutely ethical interviewer. Many times he asked leading questions in his interviews, um, but he also asked difficult questions. As a white man, he often asked other white men different questions than he would ask women or people of color. Um, and these are really important dynamics to be aware of when you're looking at his oral histories. Here on the screen, we see an example of a conversation Fredericks had with another white man, Archie Curry, who um, without knowing it gave us an example of a sundown town mindset here in La Crosse. Another interview that was done a few years later um, shows an example of a UWL faculty member who identified as a black woman, Gretchen Lockett, interviewing another black woman, Robbie Moss. The Moss family has been in La Crosse since 1852. They're considered one of the original founding families of our community. Um, and they are, they're still descendants of this family living here today. Robbie Moss's oral history gives us a few significant examples of anti-Black racism in La Crosse throughout the 20th century. Um, and it's in this interview that I first learned about the segregation signs that scattered our downtown in the 1940s. According to Moss, the NAACP were called in to help get these signs taken down. Moss also shared an experience um, during this time where she was refused service at a drugstore in downtown. And if that was true for a long-standing respected African-American resident, how were new residents or traveling Black Americans treated in our city, I wonder? In my original research, I really focused on these two articles as proof of KKK activity in, the, in La Crosse. Um, now I look at this headline on the left here that reports that the head of Wisconsin's KKK claimed that there were 500 members uh, in La Crosse. And I can understand that this isn't necessarily fact just because it was printed in the newspaper. Um, and it's likely an exaggeration to express power, right? However, it was still printed in the newspaper as a headline. So whether or not this was factual, residents living here in 1922 could have read this headline as a threat. Um, in the past few years, as the UWL Oral History Program, as well as Murphy Library Special Collections and Area Research Center have worked together to tirelessly give more access to thousands of hours of interviews in their collection, I've had more luck locating white interviewees who talked with Howard Fredericks about their involvement with the KKK and the night or perhaps multiple nights that a cross was burned on the top of Granddad's Bluff. Um, as a threat of violence for residents not really fitting in with their definition of what a community should look like. 
Um, but I did have this original article with this headline at the time. Racist language and slurs were not uncommon in our local newspapers. If you search these slurs in historic newspaper databases, um, you get thousands of results. Nathan Smith's farm was just sub was subject to this treatment for decades after his death and is still sometimes referred by older community members with this slur. Um, to learn more about Nathan Smith, you should go to the Enduring Families Project resources where they have um, a highlight on him. So in the summer of 2018, I was hired at the La Crosse Public Library um, and working in the archives and local history department means that our communities recorded histories at my fingertips every day. I'm immersed in it. Um, and this means that me and, and my colleagues who are a great support system for me, um, come across primary sources relating to anti-Black racism in our community's history all the time. Um, and we compile these sources. So I want to be sure to share with you tonight some of these important things that I've collected in the last few years. Uh, this image was shared on Facebook in 2018 showing a 1951 deed from a family cemetery plot in La Crosse, and it includes an all white clause in it. Um, this is an example of records that we don't typically see in the archives because they're usually filed away in people's homes or destroyed throughout the years. Um, we don't know for certain how long the the Woodlawn Cemetery included this clause in its deeds or whether or not other cemeteries in the city did it too. But we have this one at least to, to document it. One question one of my mentors had for me was whether or not La Crosse was in the Green Books. What I've found is that La Crosse was first represented in the Green Books in 1957, just 20 years after um, they were public, first published. One of the um, hotels listed here was actually just outside of town on Highway 16. The other hotel, Linker Hotel, was located downtown. And Linker Hotel was known as a welcoming hotel for people visiting La Crosse. We've noticed that this is where Black musicians stayed when touring through La Crosse, as well as gay musicians like Liberace. However, it's important to note that the representation in the Green Book does not prove that community was not a sundown town. So Fond du Lac is listed here on this page, and it is one of Wisconsin's most well-documented sundown towns. Um, and I'll let Nick um, and Dr. Robbins uh, talk a little bit more about that later, since they've research researched it more thoroughly than me. The Stoddard Hotel was La Crosse's most famous and popular hotel throughout the 20th century, and it was never included in the Green Book. This hotel was known to have anti-Black practices, um, my boss, Anita, shared with me that she's heard that the singer Marian Anderson was not allowed to stay at the Stoddard, um, but we've not yet found documentation for that. In 1947, the Stoddard faced a lawsuit after Black American delegates from the United Automobile, Aircraft, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America Union reported racial discrimination while staying at this hotel including being crammed into rooms together and being asked not to use the elevator or dining room. Um, at the end, sorry, in the end, the, a, the UAW funded a lawyer and one of these delegates, James Tate of Chicago, won his case in the circuit court here. In our collections here at LPL, um, we hold correspondence of the Stoddard Hotel manager, John Elliott, who wrote letters to his lawyer and the Wisconsin Hotel Association to express his frustration with the lawsuit. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat to a blog post I wrote about this last spring so you can look at more scans of those letters. On top of the oral histories that I've run across these last few years that document the local KKK activities in the 1920s, I also stumbled upon this La Crosse Tribune article that tells the story of a Black man being chased out of town by the KKK. The Tribune seems to be mocking this man, so it's quite hard to tell um, how factual it is, but I was able to find that Hayward Talbert um, was in our city in 1924, according to the city directories, and he was not in any other city directory but 1924. On the right here, we see an ad for a KKK meeting in 1926. While I have yet to find an ordinance or a policy written and passed by the city of La Crosse, we know that this, the La Crosse police targeted Black Americans throughout this time, um, and they still do. The instance of the segregation signs that 
Robbie Moss tells us about in her oral history seems to be connected to this 1942 case when an unidentified black uniformed man was um, who was presumed to be a soldier from Fort McCoy, was accused of harassing a group of young white girls. In response, the city barred all Black American soldiers stationed at Fort McCoy from entering the city. Um, and Sparta residents at one point protested the soldiers stationed at Fort McCoy by signing petitions too. So clearly I have not stopped working on this research and I likely forever will be compiling these primary sources. Um, but I'm asking different questions now than I was six years ago. And because I'm a public historian, I want to be transparent about what my changes in perspectives are. Um, and this is what I consider growth, right, since 2016. Um, so tonight I'm welcoming a group of generous and passionate and brilliant researchers and academics who I've crossed paths with in recent years. Um, and together I'm hoping that we can have an informal discussion to explore different perspectives our, of our local, regional, and national history. So on the screen here, I have a few questions that I've been wondering myself recently. And my goal tonight is for us all to leave um, with more questions than we started, which I believe is a sign of a healthy research project. Um, right, history is nuanced and, and we have to make sure that our conversations about it are too. So I'm gonna copy and paste these questions into the chat for us all to mull over tonight. I'm also going to um, paste in some of the resources that I really glossed over. So you can do more research later if you would like. Um, our program tonight is being recorded with the intention to have it posted on YouTube. You can always double back to that video to see any of the resources I shared on my slides if you want to later. So Libby, would you please introduce our panelists this evening? Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Richard Bro. Um, he's a professor of race, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. He researches the cultural and social histories of African Americans in the Midwest, including occupational racism and residential segregation in Midwest college towns during the Jim Crow and civil rights eras. Um, and then we have Riley Sabina. He's a social studies education student at UWL. He recently completed research on the local and state political climate that has contributed to Lacrosse's sundown town history. Um, and then we have Dr. Sabrina Robbins. Uh, she's the chief operations officer and integrator accident LLC, a 19 year old nationally certified 100% African-American female owned technology solutions and consulting company with 25 plus years of business. She specializes in operation management service innovation, process improvement, DEIB, and supplier diversity with experience across a variety of industries, including, including higher education, consumer product goods, government manufacturing, and construction. Dr. Robbins served in procurement, technical research, quality, supply chain, and IT vendor management positions at Kimberly, Kimberly Clark Corporation. Additionally, she was a leader within the manpower group responsible for overall client strategy, sourcing solutions and services. Recognized as a leader in workforce management solutions and supplier diversity expert. She is the winner of numerous awards and honors, Manpower Group's Supplier Diversity Circle of Excellence, State of Wisconsin Accolade Award for her Supplier Diversity Development Results, Circle of Stars Manpower Group in recognition for achieving outstanding business results, Champion of Women for International Women's Day, and Dr. Robbins is the winner of the NCMSDC Advocate of the Year, an award that is given to an individual who has continuously and consistently contributed to minority businesses development. Dr. Robinson, sorry, Dr. Robbins routinely served as a speaker for issues related to workforce diversity and entrepreneurs. In addition to her successful business career, Dr. Robbins is an award-winning public historian and community activist. Dr. Robbins was named one of the top 28 most influential African Americans in Wisconsin. Robbins was one of the one of the 12 women honored in Wisconsin in recognition of her social justice work in the 2018 Women Against Hate United by Love Traveling Art Exhibition. First African American and African American woman to be appointed to the City of Appleton Plan Commission. In 2018, she was selected by StoryCorps to amplify her experiences of living in Appleton, Wisconsin. Her interview is now housed in the African or African Fork Life Center at the Library of Congress. She was a chief contributor to A Stone of Hope, Black Experiences in the Fox Cities, an exhibit collaboration with a local history museum that details sundown town practice in Appleton. 
Um, she received a 2015 Leadership Award of Merit from AAL, AASLH for the Stone of Hope exhibit. Dr. Robbins' areas of expertise included applied statistics, research methods and design, diversity and inclusion curriculum design, vendor management, operations excellent, excellence, supplier diversity, workforce diversity, inclusion, labor and employment trends. She is also a longtime active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And then we have Nicholas Hoffman, who is the Administrator of Museums and Historic Sites at the Wisconsin Historical Society. In 2015, the History, History Museum at the Castle African Heritage Incorporated and several other community partners launched a research and community engagement project to document and share some downtown practices in Appleton, Wisconsin. Dr. Robbins and Hoffman continue to do research and share their process in history they helped bring to light. This work has received national accolades from the American Association for State and Local History and as a key participant in a national leadership grant on de facto and de jure segregation from the Institute of Museums and Library Services. Hoffman's work in public history has received numerous regional and national accolades for exhibitions, programs, and community engagement, as well as his co-authored book with Jesse J. Gant, Wheel Fever, How Wisconsin Became a Great Vice Lincoln State. And I also wanted to mention if you have any um, questions, feel free to put them in the chat and Jenny will get them to the panel. Thank you, Libby. Um, so I think to start, I'm going to go with that fourth question, or I think it's the fifth question. So what other research and or perspectives are you reminded of when considering lacrosse's sundown history? Um, Dr. Bro and I were having a really great conversation the other day. Um, where he was telling me some of his perspectives of, of after I was telling him about my 2016 research. Um, and I was hoping to start with some of your, your um, expertise, Dr. Burrow. Yes, um, thank you, Jenny. Um, hi, my name is Richard Bro. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and, and yeah, the question about, um, you know, what, other research or perspectives I'm reminded of in terms of um, looking at the wonderful um, work that you know you you did as an undergrad and that you're continuing to do uh, in your role at the Lacrosse Public Public Library and um, you know I, I think of a number of things um, I think one of the things that remains important I think when we're having conversations uh, uh, about sundown towns uh, are, you know, things like the, the importance of things like the Green Book that you pointed out, um, you know, it's, it's publication, I believe since 1938. And, um, you know, other African American, you know, historical newspapers, journals, um, things like that, you know, the Green Book, I think it represents only one facet of the ways that, you know, that African Americans sought to navigate Jim Crow as it existed, um, not just in the Southern United States, but in the upper Midwest and the West. Um, and so things, you know, newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier and the NAACP's um, Crisis Magazine, the Urban League's Opportunity Magazine, you know, these, these are all sources that play a significant role often in republishing articles, right, about the racial climate of a number of cities and towns across the United States. So people had various ways of being informed, you know, about places that were either sundown towns or had sundown tendencies. And I'm always, I'm always fascinated by the ways that, you know, African Americans, um, exercise a degree of agency. And, and so I think that, you know, one of the things that, that people who study some downtowns often struggle with is, you know, documentation of ordinances, right? Documentations of things that sort of blatantly document, um, you know, exclusion from communities or freeze outs or, or uh, other things like that. But one, one of the things we often miss, right? Are those additional African American sources? Um, the historian Patricia Turner, um, you know, she has she's done a number of, of work on African American material culture and and things like that. But one of her work uh, 
is about sort of the role of, of, of oral communication and history. Um, and she has a text called Heard It Through the Grapevine that looks at sort of the role of rumor in African-American culture, right? And the role that, that racism plays just when people are having general conversations about their experiences, right? And so that one story gets told about a place and that gets passed down orally to another group of people. Family come together for reunions. They come together for the holidays. They share stories about where they've traveled across the United States, right? And then those stories become a part of the stories that families tell about themselves. And so in some cases, you know, we can look to some of the more overt, uh, the more clearly documented evidence to talk about what's a sundown town or not. But the fact of the matter is, oftentimes African-Americans didn't need that, right? They already had this, this, uh, this line of, of, of communication that was happening in the community that told them, right? These were certain places you don't go. So I have my green book, right? I have the stories that my family have told me. I perhaps have memory of some of the things that I've read about in, in some of these African-American papers. And so while, you know, freeze outs and things like that, I, you know, are, are absolutely important to look at and to think about when thinking about sundown towns uh, or racially exclusive communities. You know, I think one of the other things to consider is the role African-Americans play in staying away because they already know these stories, right? So they, they have a strong sense of what communities are not welcoming, right? Which communities are gonna create problems for them in terms of, in terms of employment. Uh, and so, you know, these are, these are the types of things that I think are, um, are sometimes much more difficult for an archives or, uh, you know, to capture because they rely on, um, you know, they rely on an oral history sometimes of living people who, who've had those experiences. Um, it's funny because doing, you know, working on this particular, uh, working on this particular presentation or, or panel discussion reminded me, right, that I was born in a sundown town, in a former sundown town. Um, San Leandro, California, right? It has many of the same characteristics. And this, and this is, you know, the, the, the liberal San Francisco Bay Area. So I wanna make sure that, you know, we are clear about that, but San Leandro had similar demographics. Um, you know, and I, I sat and talked to my dad a couple of days ago and he said, yep, we, there, were, there were times that we knew there were only literally four black people who lived in San Leandro you know, in, in, in the 1940s, about 17 out of 66,000 in the 1950s, right? And so he was recalling these stories to, to me. And I said, well, how the heck was I born there? He said, well, by the time you were born in the 1970s, right? It was, it was no longer a sundown town because I was born, technically my family lived in Oakland, but we lived on the border between Oakland and San Leandro. So I'm, I, I, when I look at your research and, and look at your presentation, um, even right now, I'm, I'm you know, making connections between um, some of the concerns, racial concerns I see in La Crosse in the early 1900s with Chinese Americans. Um, there was a Chinese American named Li Sing who ran into some trouble in, in La Crosse in the 1910s and eventually pretty much fled lacrosse. Um, I think of the outward migration in the 1920s as the KK presence, KKK presence is increasing uh, a certain segment of lacrosse's Syrian and Lebanese community. So some of those people are still here, but others of those people left um, because we know by the 1910s and 20s, the Klan is not only an anti-Black organization, but it is an, an, you know, an anti-Catholic, it is an anti-Jewish, uh, organization. And so um, the broadening of their focus for people who were not considered completely American, or as they said, 100% American, um, you know, has implications for, for other populations of, of La Crosse. And then one of the last things I'll say in relationship to this question um, is, 
you know, I was looking at the information about the Stoddard and the union's connection to the Stoddard and that United Auto Workers um, Union, at least as a part of one of the groups mentioned in the correspondence. And I was immediately reminded that George Addis was the first, in the 1940s, was the first secretary treasurer of the United Auto Workers. And George Addis is, or was Lebanese American. He was born in La Crosse, in La Crosse's Lebanese community, right? And then his family leaves in the 1920s, that outward migration I'm talking about, that, that some of us argue at least as has connections to the rise of the KKK locally. Um, but then he eventually moves to Detroit and Dearborn and um, you know, has connections then to the UAW. So there, there are all of these fascinating you know, links and things like that, that, that I think that as this work continues, you know, can be teased out and, 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 um, and developed more. Sort of along those lines, um, today, Sabrina or Dr. Robbins and I were talking about Red Summer and its impact. And I think um, another perspective that I think is important in lacrosse is to take a step back and look at the state patterns and the national patterns. Um, in the presentation, there's a conversation or, or point that was made um, that lacrosse didn't have uh, specific violence, and it doesn't need to. Uh, 1908, Spring, uh, Springfield, Illinois, just down the border, just down the Mississippi River, East St. Louis, where hundreds of Black Americans were killed. Uh, Red Summer in Chicago. People are reminded of that. They're talking about that. Uh, we know in Appleton, where Sabrina and I did work, uh, the first congregational church was talking about Tulsa uh, within the week after it happened. So those are reminders that are influencing all of this. And when you take a step back at that key decade in the state of Wisconsin, um, doesn't matter if it is um, you know, Prentice, uh, Wisconsin, Appleton, Delavan, uh, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, La Crosse, the population decline of Black Americans, Black residents is massive. Uh, that's where we see a lot of communities going down to zero residents. And that's without coincidence. I mean, that is because of Red Summer and all of that violence for a decade. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. I mean, when I, oh, oh yeah. go ahead, Red. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I hear this question, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm, re I'm reminded of something my uh, English professor told me when uh when I told them that I wanted to research sundown towns, which was um, increasingly people are becoming aware that the North is not racist. They're just Northern racism is different than Southern racism. Um, and that's not to say sundown towns are just a, a Northern phenomenon, but um, from what I've seen, they, they're like the primary mode of northern segregation that often goes um, unnoticed until very, very recently. Um, so I think I think that's just always important to note just the uh, divide between uh, the sections of the United States. Thanks, Riley. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, one I wanted to say, as an undergraduate researcher, you did a great job with that. So <laughs> kudos to you. But also um, following up on what the uh, Dr. Bro had talked about in terms of oral histories and how that is passed through the communities. And I want to say that that network or that way of knowing is still in place today. Uh, so um, when it comes to many, bringing it back to modern times, although our communities are trying to do work and making a commitment to do better, when it comes time to recruiting talent, that oral communication is still in place. When I, um, I was recruited to come to uh, Kimberly Clark. I lived in Detroit at the time. I had never heard of Appleton. But I called um, to find out if any African Americans worked at Kimberly Clark. So I called all my sorority sisters and I got a hold of a um, executive at the time. Her name was Rosalind Brewer. She is now the CEO of 
Walgreens at this very moment. And I got a chance to talk to her. There was a difference between what Kimberly Clark recruiting team told me and the questions I asked them and the questions that I asked Rosalind Brewer. So the questions I asked Rosalind Brewer, will I be safe in Appleton? At the time, 24 years ago, Appleton was 98% white and it seemed like when I looked online, they were really proud to be 80, 90 something percent. So I was concerned about my safety and I asked her, would I be safe? Also asked, is this company ready for black female leadership? I asked, what would my life look like when I'm there? And so those, and based on that decision, you know, she said she would make sure that I'm safe. So that's the other piece. When you go someplace and someone's vouching for their place, they're responsible for you because you have to establish a community, a safe haven, uh, especially those that study history, know what these towns look like. Also, so I just wanted to add that newspapers and uh, written documents, you won't get that first voice experience of what it is to be Black in an area. Because sometimes, one, you don't have the agency to get your, your thoughts published. And two, there's retribution for that because the status is to keep it happy. One of the things we say in Appleton is the happy valve. And for the most part it is, but it's not happy for everyone for various reasons. And to have a different narrative, to have a different experience, it's hard to share. And so those that do share tend to be privileged. And so we have to be careful in our research that we're not just sharing privileged voices, but those that represent the span of the socioeconomic uh, portions of our society. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, I um, that was something that you know it, it's hard to really think of that when you're when you're immersed in a research project in undergrad. Um, but now I have a master's degree in library science, and I work in archives, and this idea of um, archives are not neutral was introduced to me when I was getting my master's degree. And what that phrase means is that, you know, archives and record keepers have historically had the same biases as the rest of society. So there's been racism and homophobia and anything that you can imagine um, in archives too, right? So archives don't contain records of all voices. Um, and when we're studying history, we have to really talk about that because there aren't always records to give voice and and there's a reason for that it's because of those dynamics in archives throughout history right so dr robbins and nick i'd really like if the two of you could talk about appleton sundown town history in your research um and maybe kind of compare that a little bit to lacrosse i think it's really great to take a step back and maybe compare lacrosse's history to another similar sized community in our state um so I'd really appreciate it if you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Nick, I just wanted to start and then I want Nick to jump in. I'm, I'm struggling with asthma, um, but I wanted to set the, the context is that we took a broadened sense and definition of, of Sundown Town. So we went beyond what Lowen said. Appleton did not have an ordinance per se, nor did Sundown have anything to do with it. The surveillance and monitoring of Black life in existence was 24 seven. And so uh, Sundown Town is the watching and restricting of Black movement. Uh, anytime there were two or three um, Black men in particular gathered, they were arrested for vagrancy laws. So just the fact of standing near each other. Uh, we don't have a lot of deeds because we weren't able to establish roots. And so you're just blocked out of employment. You're blocked out of housing um, and just blocked out in those ways. And so I think it's a good uh, distinction to make of 
what does sundown town look like? And we were able to determine that through uh, historical records, but centering blackness. A lot of time, even when the uh, black account is in the historical record, the newspaper, it's overlooked. And so you don't see the direct quote, you don't see the, uh, the name of the person, and you skip over to something else. The black experience had just been uh, shut out in historical memory in Appleton that no one has memories of blacks in the area before the late 60s. But our work with uh, Nick and our research team have found a lot of newspaper accounts where Blacks are talking about their experiences. So I just wanted to set it in context and ask uh, Rick, uh, Nick to go through our research with the understanding that we have a broadened view of Sundown Town. Because of that, I say that Appleton and all these areas are still Sundown Towns, that this is not an historical past, but a very real practice that happens today. And uh, I just wanted to share real quick that I uh, just found something quick online that in 2017, the NAACP issued a travel warning for the entire state of Missouri. Black travel, safe travel is still precarious. And um, that same travel warning was issued in 2020 in San Antonio, Texas. We have accounts from here in Appleton where we have executives that are interviewing for jobs. We're just everyday people coming up asking, why are you here? You know, so this whole thing is um, historical memory, but it is current practice. And it's not being reported in the newspaper. We are getting this through oral history. African heritage in this area is, has taken on the uh, commitment to record those uh, oral histories. Go on, Nick. Thanks. Um, I'll give a really high level overview. And it is a very similar pattern across the entire state of Wisconsin. In many ways, Appleton is sort of representative of what so many communities experienced. Um, long before the Civil War, there were free Black men who were working in the fur trade um, along the Fox River and throughout the entire state of Wisconsin, um, especially true in La Crosse and the Driftless region. Um, there also was slavery um, and in our corner of the state, uh, particularly at Fort Howard, where there were officers from the South who um, occasionally brought enslaved individuals uh, with them to work at Fort Howard. Uh, after the Civil War is when we really start to see settlement pick up. There was new freedoms and opportunities for movement. Um, and so Appleton's Black populations starts to grow. And I will add that we never really have a firm number of how many African Americans were living in the city during that time period. Um, there's been some research done in Oshkosh and the Black press out of Milwaukee is so critical to all of this work because you get history through the eyes of Black Wisconsinites. And uh, in Oshkosh, for instance, there's just one little mention that there was a large number of Black men who were working in the lumber industry. And uh, it was hard to gauge, actually, how large Oshkosh's Black population was for a short period around 1900. So I would assume the same type of movements in, in lumber and wood products is probably also happening in the cross. It would be something to research. Um, but in Appleton, right after the Civil War, um, we have uh, a lot of people coming to the city. They're finding some opportunities, but very limited opportunities. Um, basically, uh, I've come to the understanding that most Wisconsin cities that we look at um, around 1860 to 1880 are going to have multiple Black-owned barbershops. And as we found um, in, in Northeast Wisconsin, uh, so many of these paper and lumber towns would burn to the ground. And so there's really great tax records and insurance claims. And very often it's these black barbershop owners who were so critical to the entire city um, and were some of the most successful business owners in their communities. And so Appleton has this growth. There was some um, integration. The uh, Grand Army of the Republic did allow black uh, 
uh, members of their post. Uh, some churches like the First Baptist Church and First Congregational Church were integrated in Appleton. Appleton's black population uh, was never really stable and large enough um, to support something like an AME church, but I think that's a big opportunity for research in Wisconsin. There are AME churches during this time period all over the state that disappeared by about 1920 in these patterns. So there's this really big growth. Um, some really critical people that also need to be brought forward in state history. Uh, Lucretia Newman Coleman was a student at Lawrence University. Um, her family lived in Appleton for several decades. Um, in the 1890s, nationally, she's known as a major contributor uh, to Black writing. But if you look at our state histories of authors, she's never mentioned, but she's known nationally already in the 1890s. So that kind of reconciling needs to happen in all of our communities. Um, by about 1915, as this settlement is really starting to grow, it's becoming stable, that's when we start to see the clues emerge that Appleton and so many other communities across the state of Wisconsin are starting to change. In 1915, we have our first two big pieces of evidence. There's a newspaper article um, about the Tuskegee Singers doing one of their fundraising tours uh, throughout the northern United States. Uh, went to find a hotel after their performance at Lawrence and uh, they were they checked three locations and were unable to find a place to stay so that was major headlines in Appleton and elsewhere. Um, that same year in 1915 we have one newspaper description of uh, the police having a patrol wagon parked at the main train intersection just outside the city and that uh, a black bricklayer was uh, harassed by the police and was taken immediately into custody and while that uh, black bricklayer was taken through the city, young kids came out and yelled slurs at the man as he was being taken into prison. So that's one of our bigger pieces. Um, by the 1950s, our evidence really poured forward. I, I should mention one thing, um, Appleton's black population declines to nearly zero by 1920, and then it's firmly zero by 1930. Um, but again, in the context of all this happening nationally in the Midwest, uh, the black press, uh, press in Appleton, uh, they're talking about things that are happening in St. Louis. That's not a secret to any, any Black resident in Wisconsin. And so no doubt people are fearful where the next Springfield is going to be, where the next East St. Louis is going to be. Um, and so that population decline happens really fast. In Wisconsin, our KKK presence actually really jumps just like it does across the whole Midwest in about 1922. That's when it really starts to rise in Appleton, especially by 1924. Um, so the KKK is not responsible for making Appleton all white. They often get the blame. It's not them. It's everyday citizens who are a part of it. Um, the KKK certainly kept Appleton white in a lot of cities across the state of Wisconsin, but the damage is done in the decade that preceded them. Um, by 1950, that's when we really start to see more evidence coming forward. I would describe this as really the peak era of the sundown town practice in, in Appleton. Um, in 1950, I forget it was 51 or 52, uh, Lawrence University student uh, published in the newspaper uh, a paper that she did for one of her classes. She cold called, actually she was doing the work for the St. Louis Urban League, which is sort of neat uh, having just come from St. Louis, but she cold called area businesses to try and understand what their practices were, because she had also heard this conversation in the city that the city is a sundown town. Um, so she cold called businesses. And I think it's really important to one of our other questions. You know, what does this look and feel like in the community? Every single business had a different answer. Some businesses were really quick to respond that they welcome everybody. Um, Jake Skull's Colonial Wonder Bar uh, was just as if it came out of the South. Um, black travelers had to go to the back door of the kitchen and order there. If they were a business person, they could eat in the kitchen. If they were a traveler in general, they had to eat outside. And that type of sort of scenario, that case by case for each business looked very different for what she called. Um, in 1952, we also get it in writing. So we know that people, um, you know, right residents of the area knew that this was a very common practice. There was, and I, I sorry, I forget the specific state agency, but um, there was a study done right after World War II into the 1950s looking at discrimination in employment practices across the state. And it'd be really interesting to see what they say about lacrosse. Um, but the investigator uh, went business by, excuse me, industry by industry in Appleton. And she talked to Victor Bloomer. And I recall he operated uh, some sort of machinist company. And he said, and I'll quote this, uh, there's an unwritten law that evidently keeps Negroes out of Appleton even for an overnight stay. So he said the practice clear as day in 1952. Um, no other 
Appleton business owner was that direct in their description of what was going on. Again, it was very vague and different practices. Um, he's the only one who really addressed it. Uh, but in neighboring Green Bay, uh, two business owners actually talked about Appleton being a sundown town. So this was something that was just commonly known, didn't need to be an ordinance, but it was really clearly a part of the practice of, of Appleton. Um, and then continuing with our centering of stories um, on, on Black community members, it is directly in, 19, in the 1960s, Black students at Lawrence who really led the charge to challenge the city as a sundown practice. And every time I think Sabrina and I read back to the paper, um, they were bringing in who's who of the civil rights movement of that era. They were inviting everybody to come to campus, um, help organize the students, um, and, then, and then try and speak to the community. And eventually Dr. King came, uh, he visited uh, uh, Appleton, well not Appleton, Menasha nearby. It's a blurry line between the communities, uh, but he visited UW Fox Valley and challenged the community to become a welcoming place, a uh, haven as he described for Negroes. Yeah, and then I just wanted to add, thank you, Nick, for doing such a wonderful job, that in the 1930s, I think it was 1937, Dr. Uh, Percy Julian, oh, yeah. who was a renowned chemist, uh, interviewed and got hired for a position at the Paper Institute. And so, you know, the, the Valley's full of of uh, paper, the paper industry. So you have someone that is known and talented and uh, was not able to secure housing. And so because he could not get housing because of our um, sundown practices, I don't think we had racial covenants just yet, but sundown practices, that's how he moved to Chicago. And so a lot of what we know about uh, the Black experience come from also the Chicago uh, Defender. So again, going back to what Dr. Bro had mentioned. And then uh, in the 40s, uh, there was a, a farmer uh, worker program. And so we had uh, Jamaicans uh, that uh, migrated or were brought in, immigrants brought in to do work. And so special housing was built for them, looked like barracks, right on the outskirts of what was out of town at that time. And then a whistle will go off, I think it was six o'clock, Nick. And yep. that, was their, that was their signal to get back to their uh, area. So again, when Nick and I did this research, that was just in the forties. And when we had our community remembrance to see who remembers these things, nobody remembers. Um, black presence at all. And so I just wanted to add uh, those in that we denied Dr. Percy Julian uh, <laughs> presidency. And then we had imported uh, a, a large amount of Jamaican workers because we had no, we didn't have enough labor in our area to do the jobs. For, for every community, I think one of the things that Sabrina and I really learned is that the best sources that we were gonna find were really out of the community because there was that early black community in Appleton which completely left. And so that community memory wasn't there. Um, so you know, the community scattered across the Midwest, even further West. And so we were able to track down some of those sources, but for all of our communities uh, in Wisconsin, the Chicago Defender is going to have things to say about what's happening in your communities. Uh, the black press throughout the whole Midwest will occasionally cover. We've even found uh, communist newspapers in New York City in the 1970s that uh, described Appleton as, as a sundown town. So um, it's important to look at sources in all corners of the United States and beyond because you'll, you'll find a lot of uh, important work. Thank you both for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's really important when we're looking and thinking about our local history um, to compare it to other places in the same state or the same region and to compare it to the national level and the global level because um, that's, that's what allows you to contextualize your local history, right? So um, I really thank you both for giving us that perspective tonight. Um, and Riley, I, I'm hoping to get you to get you to talk a little bit about your research too, because you did that. You, I, I was saying earlier how I didn't really talk about pre-1906 in, in my research um, for a reason, because it had already been pretty well documented. 
Um, but Riley went and actually looked into the voting records to see what the political climate was like in La Crosse right before the sundown town era. Um, and Riley, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so this is where the history gets very, very nuanced very quickly because I went in there basically with two, two different kind of perspectives. So as, as Jenny mentioned, Mauser did most of the research on early 1800s La Crosse, and that's where, I, where most of my research has been done. And as far as I know, he doesn't even call La Crosse a sundown town at any point in his research, he doesn't. Yes. Um, and he blames um, the large exodus of African-Americans solely on the lumber industry declining. And then meanwhile, um, Lowen, who literally wrote the book on sundown towns, um, the most uh, known one at least, um, basically blames it all on political um, change. Basically a switch from Democrat to Republican and, and, and or Republican to Democrat in Northern cities. Um, and I, I went in and investigated both of those and I didn't, neither of them really held up. In fact, the opposite was true for Lowen's idea um, La Crosse started Democrat when it had the largest African American population, and um, and by the time the 1890s roll around, which is when we start seeing that very quick decline, it's voting Republican at like a four to one ratio, um, and and I can't really make sense of that honestly. Um, it, it's it, it's remarkable because when you read the Democrat newspaper, La Crosse Democrat. Um, it openly compares um, freed slaves in the South to like a plague of locusts from the Bible. Um, yet we, we know as um, both Dr. Robbins and I, uh, Hoffman have said that this was a place of black barbers. Um, this is the time when La Crosse was until the present day at its most integrated. Um, it had its a prosperous black middle class um, and that and that eventually disappears just within the next few, um, just the next few decades after after that. Um, with the lumber industry, it was a lot more nuanced in the sense that the lumber industry does decline, but um, it, it goes through several recessions very very um, at various points. So in 1859, right before the Civil War, there's or 1857, there's a recession right before the Civil War. During the Civil War. They can't send lumber down to like St. Louis, so there's a recession then. Um, there's a recession uh, during 1877, and then there's the very bumpy ride where in the 1890s where it jumps up and down and up and down, up and down a few times over the decade. Um, and I just have a very hard time tying that back to um, that decline specifically back to sundown towns because the, the recessions were a lot worse earlier. Um, and lacrosse's industry was a lot less developed and a lot less, um, what's the word I'm looking for, diversified. Um, it's also important to note um, now, I think, uh, that lacrosse's sundown town is very, very closely tied to labor history. Um, so the most prominent African-American in lacrosse was a man named George Dillon Taylor, who was a very, very prominent labor advocate um, he ran a newspaper called the Wisconsin Labor Advocate, um, and he helped get a third party progressive uh, candidate elected in the 1880s. Um, and that caused a lot of racial tension in La Crosse. Um, it, he was, he is very openly kind of shocked by the slurs he gets called, or at least in his newspaper, he, he kind of plays that up. Um, he um, and uh, he complains. His house gets burglarized one day. He complains about um, a, a lack of like police protection. That the not the police that are harassing him, but they are they're not protecting him. But he's he's they're kind of letting him be harassed by the population until eventually he just straight up leaves town around 1890, which is also coincidentally when we know most African Americans start to leave the city. So that's. That's where my research has mostly led me to. It's, it's a very large mixture of factors that 
uh, led to led to this. Yeah. And um, I, I, I just want to say as well, I wouldn't want to neglect the uh, national focus either, but I'm not going to get into that right now either. I just want to say great job on your uh, research. It's always exciting to uh, hear students that have such uh, enthusiasm. And I totally understand when you said um, the research is nuanced and it does take what I call a layering to understand Wisconsin history, regional along with the national. So with uh, uh, African-Americans or blacks right after the civil war, we weren't Democrats. We were the party of Lincoln. So we were Republicans at the time. So it makes sense that the Democrats would uh, make those comments about uh, African-Americans because that is the Southern delegation you know, Democrat view that probably was accepted here. And so, um, and then being mindful of the years of what's going on. So you have uh, the high point of reconstruction it, don't, it lasted a short period of time. And then uh, the warring against reconstruction. So as we broaden our lens, we're starting to see massive race uh, massacres in the United States. And they are in the South moving North. And so it would explain why um, some of that movement that we see out because now there's competition for jobs as the um, blacks are moving away from Jim Crow and moving into um, you know, areas for job opportunities. So I just want to say good job for that. Yep, and, and that's exactly where um, labor history starts to come in as well because African-Americans were disproportionately used as, as strike breakers. Um, so when, when predominantly white uh, workers would, would go on strike, they could potentially, um, it, it would create racial tension between them uh, over those. Yeah, it, yeah, and it challenges the notion that we even see today that uh, whites are deserving of jobs over blacks. Exactly. Yeah. One of, one of the things you know that I I can appreciate, and, and one of the things that I think it's important to remember um, about organized labor at the time, particularly in terms of AFL affiliates, um, because it's one of the largest organized bodies. Um, and collective bargaining units that existed in the United States at the time. But the, the AFL openly, you know, um, supported locals that, that instituted racial um, exclusion, the exclusion of women, regardless of race. And so, you know, those types of policies would facilitate then the attitudes um, by, you know, by the fact that, that you know, people of color and women are excluded from those unions allows then, right, members of those unions to scapegoat the very people that they excluded from the union in the first place, right? So then when those people show up as so-called strike breakers, they can only do that because of the refusal of white workers to accept people of color into their unions in the, in the first place, right? So it, a lot of those are, are, are ways that, again, a national picture, right? Larger national um, political struggle, organizational struggle, labor struggle, um, filters down then to the local or the regional level and has a, you know, a, a complex, complex impact on um, not only race relations, but labor race relations and the ways that those intersect. Thank you. Um, I want to remind people that um, you can be putting questions in the chat for our panelists too. Um, so far, we've all been kind of guiding the conversation, but we do want the audience members to ask questions for us. Um, so please do that. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, and while people are doing that, um, one question we've kind of touched on a few times, both by talking about Appleton and the cross too, um, is can one researcher really determine the definition of a sundown town? Um, and I was hoping to get some opinions on that question, um, because I think that 
you know, for, for people who are in the historian world like us, um, the answer to that question maybe is kind of obvious and, and we all look at different perspectives, right? Um, but for people who don't look at history every day or think about history every day like us, um, they learn about history through things like James Lowen's book, right? And they don't have a lot of time to, to be reading and studying these things like us. So they might have a, a different idea of, of, of the answer to that question. Um, so would any of you like to, to take a stab at that? I, I guess I'll be brief about it real quick. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can't um, have one uh, person determine the, the definition of a sundown town. I mean, um, just because no one person can have all that knowledge. Um, to put it bluntly, no one's going to be perfect. Um, you're going to need competing ideas to kind of, in, in academia, to compete to see which works properly in some areas and which don't. I mean, look, uh, the, the book, the Sundown Towns book, Lowen wrote, has a very strong bias towards Southern Illinois, where he did most of his research. That's where most of his examples come from. And I mean, I just talked about very briefly how in my research, when I tried to apply it to here, it, it, it didn't really work. I mean, there's some things that held with like um, how sundown towns operate and, um, you know, how they enforce their, their regulations, but it, it just fell apart when um, you tried to apply the reasoning behind that happened just instantly. It was just a quick look at the, the, the voting records. So, yeah, I mean, you have to have more than one. Yeah. Um, I also, uh, I think it's many perspectives, but have some commonality in it. I know we talk a lot about Lowen, but we do have a lot of Black writers that talk about Sundown Town. They just haven't been given the platform or the exposure. So uh, my recommendation is when looking at Sundown Towns, seek um examples and push yourself to read beyond Lowen. Uh, we've all reported that uh, you know we've African heritage and Nick, our work focused on the black experience, but we know that it happened to Jewish people. Um, and not everybody was considered white. So Italians were not always considered white. So they too, back in uh, the early parts and before they were granted uh, whiteness, uh, experienced these things. Sometimes it was the Catholics, sometimes it's Irish, sometimes it's Native Americans. So getting those experiences from multiple views, uh, especially if it's from your area, will help to discern the appropriate methodology for your region and then be able to speak to that for, um, to develop a more national model. Even Lowen had difficulties at times because he would say uh, a town is a, a sundown town. And then he would say, nope, it's not a sundown town anymore. And then he would recap, classify it again as a sundown town. So even as the perceived leader of sundown towns, the methodology was not sound. And it was, it's not sound because there's a strong local context. And oftentimes we are outsiders that don't understand the cultural nuance and experience trying to apply our lens to an experience we don't know, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm gonna add, I know that, that I respect, respect the work of, um, of James Lowen and the work he put into to his, his uh, book on sundown towns, but um, I think there's a tendency of some scholars to feel like they own a particular subject matter or topic, right? Uh, and so they often then become kind of the long voice um, in dominating the narrative and dominating the literature on you know, on things like sundown towns. And I often say that, you know, sundown towns represent one of those many things that was Columbus, right? So it's Columbus as a verb um, that black people, we knew it was there, right? Like I said, you, you, you could talk to almost any African-American 
who lived in the upper Midwest during this time period, or even lived in the South or the West during this time period. And, and they could tell you, uh, you know, almost anything you wanted to know about sundown towns. And, and like Dr. Robbins points out, right? Um, because those voices, because those people don't have the platform, right? Then we just presume that pretty much sundown towns, no one's really talking about them until James Lowen um, publishes this book. And so, you know, I'm reminded of, of a lot of the, the desegregation narratives of people who desegregated like the, the University of Oklahoma. And so Ada Lois Scipio, um, who was one of the students who, grad, who desegregated the University of Oklahoma and Norman um, at the graduate level, you know, she writes about Norman being a sundown town and very much like Lawrence University in Appleton, right? Sometimes there's this really interesting and, and nuanced relationship. You want to talk about nuance between universities, right? And the cities in which they are functioning and they are practicing. And they can sometimes sort of toss responsibility for who is driving the bus, so to speak, in terms of making a town exclusive, right? So you ask people at the university and they say, well, it's the people in Lawrence or the people in Norman, Oklahoma, right? And then you might talk to one or two people in Norman, Oklahoma or in Appleton and say, well, it's really the people at the university, right? Who have more political influence or control in, in this community. So you see this kind of, you know, passing, passing the, the buck uh, in terms of race that often happen especially in, in you know, university communi communities or small college towns or mid-sized college towns um, even. So there's, there's this you know, interesting phenomenon where many of the institutions that still exist in these communities today you know, were very much culpable in setting the racial tone and climate of these communities. And it, it reverberates to today, right? We still see the effects of that in 2021. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we haven't gotten any questions yet. We've gotten some nice compliments and some nice sharing of information in the chat here. Um, but maybe these last few minutes, what we can talk about is what do we do with all this information? Where do we go? What, what can we as community members living in these places do with this information, right? Um, for me, <laughs> it's just been um, trying to be a public historian. That's what I've been doing with this information, right? but I haven't really found answers past that. Um, and I think a lot of us are experiencing those questions and, and struggling with an answer. Um, so you as my panelists, what do you suggest? What do you think? Well, I just wanna say, uh, just emphasize the public part of public historian and that's to tell the story. And uh, we're blessed that we have time to read and write and think uh, and we are the care carers and have the responsibilities to share. So as we look at what's going on today, it's important that we speak because we have made some, um, some advances, but I reported earlier that in 2020, black travelers are still facing things. So we're not done. So we just had, I, I know that uh, Lacrosse had BLM activities, Black Lives Matter activities. As public historians, we should be collecting oral histories. So we just reported that not all stories make the news. Not all stories are in the newspaper. And so we should take our skills and share it and collect those stories so that when the narrative, the narrative is already shifting and it's only been a few months of what, who gets to be a demonstrator, what's a riot and who's a protester and why are they in the streets? I don't think we have enough conversation that in Northeast Wisconsin, that includes uh, in uh, La Crosse as well and predominantly white uh, communities. I don't think there's been enough exploration as to why whites are charting, chanting and marching for Black Lives Matter. And that needs to be recorded. Uh, we are collecting things. So uh, I have a videotape 
of College Avenue that's a problematic area in our uh, community. And it's the, one of our main streets. And there was a Trump rally, a lot of patriotic flags. Now, those of us that are trained know that there's sort of a dual meaning of that. And I don't really feel comfortable around a bunch of American flags. And sure enough, it was supposed to be about Trump, even though he lost, they all got in their F-150s and their flags running up and down. And one lady on a camera shouted out white power. That just happened a number of months ago. And so whose job is it to be out observing and seeing what's going on in the community? That's our job. So I'd like us to be more uh, public, be inclusive in our lens, be willing to make insertions as we um, do more. And some of us will have to be brave because you have donors and donors that are committed to a set history. But we know that history is not set. So for us to be brave, to be public and help get the public engaged to help us collect and make our institutions and organizations trusted um, gatherers and recipients of the information and artifacts that come into our possession. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Um, does anyone else have any anything to build on? Yeah, I will, I will try to make it quick, right? Um, so one of the major goals of Sundown Towns was clearly to exclude people from community, right? It's, I think it's one of the most obvious things. And so when I think about what's happening today and what we can do today, I think about the ways that we continue to exclude people from community or excuse, exclude people from community resources, right? So the continued presence of things like food deserts and lacrosse, right? And the way that those disproportionately impact, you know, poor residents of lacrosse and people of color in lacrosse. Uh, and sometimes those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? Um, I think about the recent work that was just done in the last year of recording the experiences of students of color, right, in La Crosse School District, because one of the things that we learned from those students, and, and Dr. Robbins mentioned some of the BLM activity in La Crosse, some of that was around the disproportionate punishment of Black children, right, in La Crosse public schools. And students recognize that they are not being treated fairly, right, that they are being um, more, much more harshly punished for things that their uh, white classmates either receive no punishment or just uh, a slap on the wrist for, right? And so that same process of um, excluding people from resources, whether it is the voices of an administrator or validating their stories, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I was proud of students when they walked out um, I also, like I said, appreciate the effort to document those on, on video for people in our community to see. However, if the culture of the schools themselves don't change, we just have those stories and the conditions about which they are speaking are still not changing and they are still negatively impacting these children, their future and their life choices. I just want to take a minute and uh, recognize the president, uh, our vice president and co-founder of the African Heritage Inc, Dr. Bola Delano Oriero. And I see her comment in here. So one, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Oriero for joining us today. She is a, a significant contributor to our research. And her comment is uh, that we should speak out and advocate that these stories are accurately included in our K-12 curriculum. So I just want to make sure uh, that uh, our president is one recognized and co-founder and to get her comment out there. Yeah, I was gonna comment on that um, because I'm a history education and although my, where to go with this 
research in like the broad picture sense is, is not clear to me immediately, um, to put it bluntly. For on the personal level, um, it's, it's always been a bit more clear. Um, and that is that I can tell and teach students about this history. Um, and I can tell and teach other people about this history as well, like I'm doing right here. Um, and every person um, educated that knows about this is um, a person that can help fix the aftershocks of, of this problem. So that's, that's where I go with it. Thanks, Riley. Nick, did you have any last words? I would only say that uh, the work needs to happen across the state. Um, I have a colleague who um, in the UW system who's been mapping population across the entire state, every county, and the pattern is there. And places like Superior, there's, I mean, it's one of the largest black communities around 1900 in the state of Wisconsin, it's way up in Superior. Um, and even larger when you consider Duluth, also a very large black community, Amy Church. So. Um, we need to see this replicated in communities across the entire state um, to really get a better understanding of our Black history, but also to start having these conversations in our communities. Thanks. Well, to close out, I'll say this, that I am a librarian at the La Crosse Public Library, and if there are any teachers from La Crosse watching this right now, just reach out to me, right? Um, we have these primary sources for you to talk about in your classrooms. Um, we're here. Our job is to provide resources for you as, as our community members. So yeah, um, I'll end on that. Thank you all so much for tonight. It was very lovely. Um, and I hope you all take care. <laughs>